Hey, what's happening, every nation? Bryson, welcome to our online platform. Glad that you're here and trusting that the next 45 minutes to an hour will add value to your life, particularly in you growing in knowing God and making Him known. Um, before we get to the message today that I truly believe will be encouraging to you uh, and will be inspiring for you, uh, two quick announcements. One, if you're a guest, maybe this is your first or second time visiting our online platform here on YouTube, do us a favor, click on the connection card below and fill out the details. Take you about 40 seconds or so, but it will give us an opportunity to connect with you and find ways that we can serve you and connect you to our spiritual family here at Every Nation Price. And glad you're here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch and connect with us. Secondly, uh, at the airing of this video, it should be the 20th of November. Now, the 20th of November is our Do Something Sunday. Twice a year, we close down our Sunday services and we go into the community to serve, that we are not just Christ-centered or spirit-empowered, but we're also wanting and endeavoring to be socially responsible churches uh, in and where God has called us to be. And so we're going to be going back to Risho Miller Primary School that we were at early on in the year and serving them further, uh, bringing resources to them, but also trusting God to purchase goalposts for them that they haven't had for about a year or two. Uh, they recently had um, their goalposts stolen, and so whenever they have to play soccer, they have to travel to other schools to do that. You, as Every Nation Bryanston, are going to be part of that process of making sure that they have the means to do what they are called to do. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness that allows us to continue to be a church that touches the city uh, in a profound way. Um, today, because it's do something, we are importing a message. Last time we did this as well, uh, and this time is going to be just as good and, dare I say, just as important. Today, our speaker is a lady by the name Daniel Strickland. She is from Toronto, Canada, uh, well known for her work in the Salvation Army. Um, this particular video is from one of our Every Nation world conferences. Now, I say this um, not only as a kind of precursor to her preaching um, uh, here online, but also as a advertisement or a promotion for our Every Nation World Conference happening next year. Next year, October, we are going to be having Every Nation World Conference happening in Cape Town. And for you, here at Every Nation, Bryanston, I want to highly encourage you to get onto our everynation.org website, uh, start looking at the details and start preparing for our time all the way in Cape Town for our Every Nation World Conference. This is going to be over 70 different nations brought together, worshiping Jesus, uh, being called on mission for Jesus. It's going to be a blast of a time. You don't want to miss it. Now, a couple of years ago, in one of those world conferences, Daniel Strickland shared this message. I think it is apt not only for our Do Something Sunday, but it's also apt for the kind of people we want to be as we go into the world. So without further ado, Daniel Strickland. And the big question is, where are we going next, baby? Cape Town, South Africa! I'm so glad to be here. What an honor to be with you. Uh, an absolute delight. And also, by the way, my favorite word is go. <laughs> like, I see it everywhere. I see go everywhere. Like, I don't know about you, but even when I see a yellow light, <laughs> 
Any other, I, like, I know that the, the, the manual tells me when you see a yellow light, you should hear the word stop. But I hear the word go. I, every time, I hear the word go, go, go. And so I'm so excited. I really believe that we are living in a go time. Uh, I think uh, the words of Jesus when he called his first disciples, this has been amazing. I cannot get this out of my mind, actually. Get, get, get it out of my prayers even. I keep hearing the words of Jesus again in Mark's Gospel 115. You remember, he, he comes across the, the first disciples, he calls them. It's amazing because the disciples he calls first are actually the disciples of John the Baptist. Really interesting. And John the Baptist's disciples have just been part of an incredible movement in the wilderness. You, you remember John the Baptist. I mean, this wild, crazy man in the desert eating locusts. I mean, wild camel hair and, and, and thousands of people coming, being baptized in repentance. This is a revival in the wilderness. This is happening. Even kings are coming. John the Baptist so incredibly inspired and filled with the Spirit of God and just this move happening. He says to King Herod, you know, there's someone coming who's going to like chop down your tree at the root, which I'm pretty sure is like giving him the finger. <laughs> and Herod responds, of course, the, the, the fiery as Herod responds by, you know, imprisoning him and then chopping off his head. And then what happens, we don't really know what happens. We, the disciples obviously go back to what they knew before the move happened. The disciples go back to what is safe, the backup plan. They go back to fishing. And then Jesus comes along to those very disciples, and this is what he says to them. <laughs> the time is now. The kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is what he says to the disciples, the first disciples who were already part of some kind of a movement, who maybe had 25 years of history doing incredible things. <laughs> you should hear this. Jesus comes along in this time, in this season, in this day, and he says, the time is now. The kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news. And what's fascinating about it, of course, is that when we talk about repentance and faith, we almost always use that phrase when we're talking to unbelievers. You need to repent and believe the good news. That's kind of how, but Jesus is not speaking in that passage of scripture to unbelievers. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to those who are part of the movement. He's talking to those who have seen incredible things, miraculous things. They've seen the power of the Spirit manifest in a man in a wilderness on fire with the glory of God. That's what they've seen. And he says to them, repent and believe the good news. What? What? Repent and believe the good news. Now, I, I'm from Canada. And uh, what that means is that I can ski. <laughs> now, I'm not a very good skier. I'm what I call a survivor skier. What that means is that if I ski by myself, I'll probably survive. But if you ski with me, you might not. <laughs> And I had a friend who was an avid skier, and she convinced me to go night skiing with her. She lent me all the equipment, and so I went night skiing with her, and I remember I'm on this chairlift going up this mountain at night, and that's when I see it. I see the moon. Like, I see the moon, but it's not just a, the moon. It's like on fire. It's crimson red. It's full. And I remember thinking to myself, whoa, like, Jesus could come back tonight. You know, if you've seen that bumper sticker, it says, uh, Jesus is coming, quick, look busy. <laughs> and I was like, nuts, Jesus is gonna come and I'm skiing, you know? That's not how I planned it, but anyway, I'm just, I said to my friend, Jenny, look at the moon, it's amazing. I remember Jenny looks at the moon and she just goes, oh, it's full. I'm like, ow. Oh. What? And all night long, we're having this conversation about how amazing this moon is, and Jenny's just not getting it. And finally, the, the final run of the night, I'm just like, Jenny, I just need you one more time to look at the I just feel like you're missing. This is the most glorious moon I've ever seen in my entire life, and I've seen a lot of moons, you know? <laughs> look again. Like, it's the best thing I've ever seen. So Jenny looks again. She looks, at, she looks at me. She looks at the moon. She looks at me. She goes, oh, she says. You know those are rose-tinted goggles, right? <laughs> I, 
I said, I do now. <laughs> you know, my, my first thought was like, how can I get away with wearing these every day for the rest of my life? I mean, these things, they were amazing. And I, Jesus did not have rose tinted goggles on, but he did have goggles on. He had a kingdom lens through which he saw everything. You know this, Jesus sees everything and everyone differently than any of us ever, ever did before. I mean, he just literally, I mean, he just sees things completely differently because the way he sees things is through a kingdom lens. It's not rose tinted, it's not naive, he's not idealistic, he doesn't not know about the, the things that are happening or the sin or the evil or the, the, the difficulties, he's, he's not naive. He just sees things differently than anybody else. He sees everyone differently than they'd ever been seen before. See, Jesus sees things through a kingdom lens. And I wanna take a look at just one little picture out of the life of Jesus, one instance that helps us discover how Jesus sees things differently and how he invites us as disciples to see things the way he sees things so that we can participate in the now time, so that we can go because the kingdom of God is near and we need to repent and believe. Now repentance, just for the, the record, is from the metanoia in Mark 1.15. Metanoia is the Greek word for repentance and it means this this, change the way you see. Change the way you see. Change your mind. Change your perspective. Change the way you see everything and everyone. And that's what Jesus is going to invite us to do. So John chapter 9, verses 1 uh, to 7. Here we go. Jesus is walking along and he sees a man who's been born blind Rabbi, his disciples ask him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night's coming and then no one can work, but while I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva and he spread the mud over the blind man's eyes and he told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus sees everything and everyone differently. Case in point, a blind man begging by the side of the road. When the disciples see him, they ask Jesus, whose fault is this? <laughs> the man or his parents? And can I just say right off the top that this is the greatest temptation of our time? is to see tragedy, is to see oppression, is to see sin, is to see pain, and to stay in this question, whose fault is it? This will keep us paralyzed for generations to sit around talking about it. Let's, let, let, let's start a committee and talk about the theological, theological ramifications of sin. Whose fault is it? We do this all the time with every social justice issue you can imagine, with every nation that's in conflict. We sit around asking this question, whose fault is it? Is it his fault or is it his parents? And you know what, the temptation for this is so deep within us. We have these discussion by the sides of the roads, and listen, this is what I have to say about that. Even if you could come up with an answer, which by the way, is very difficult to do, whose fault is sin? The complexity of that answer, it's everyone's fault. I mean, take any issue. Eventually, you're going to land on the fact that it's a man's fault. <laughs> but even beyond that, it's also more than their fault, right? It's society's fault. It's the culture's fault. It's the church's fault. I mean, think about, pick one issue, the foster care, the orphan epidemic around the world. Whose fault is it? Is it the parents' fault? Yes. Is it the country? Sure. Is it the church's fault? Where have we been? Hello. Yes. It's everybody's fault. And even if you come up with a really good answer to whose fault it is, guess where you are? You're still at the side of a road with a blind guy. 
You've gotten nowhere. All of your talking and all of your committees and all of the ramifications, you get nowhere. You're still at the side of the road. Jesus reframes this whole situation. See, when, when, when the disciples see it, they see sin. When the disciples see through this lens that they're used to looking at, maybe the lens of religion or just the lens of culture or the lens of, 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 of their own lives, whatever, they see sin, they see problem, they see disease, they see unwanted, they see rejected, they see oppressed. Jesus looks, he sees apostle. He sees glory. He sees possibility. He sees the kingdom of God. He sees the advance of God's agenda on the earth. You see what I mean? He sees everyone differently. And the invitation that Jesus is giving you is to enter into that, is to say, I want to see things through the lens of the kingdom first. I want to see things the way that Jesus sees them. And this is what he says. He says this, this man was born blind for the glory of God. For the glory of God, for the essence of God to be revealed, for the light to penetrate the darkness, for the things of the kingdom to be on display like stars, the scripture says, in a dark and depraved generation. We go to the darkest spots. You know, the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, he used to instruct his officers when they would go try to take a city for Jesus. He would say, this is your best strategy. Listen to me. He said, you go find the darkest place. Go find the lost soul, the most hardest person. Person, the person whose heart is hard, where the whole town agrees, that man is impossible to change. You start there. Start there. Because this, the lost, the oppressed, the poor, it's not a tragedy. It's not just a tragedy. It's a strategy. It's a strategy. Those places, the depth of the darkness, the, the, the oppression, the layers, the, that can't be done. Those places that you can find on the earth, everywhere, where everybody's standing around asking whose fault is it. That's where you start to see the glory of God. That's where the kingdom gets advanced. That's where the light penetrates the darkness. That's where the sacredness of God is on display for the whole world to hear. And listen, Jesus says this, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us. I'm not sure I really fully understood the urgency of this, but it's dawning on me very clear. We're living in a time. We're living in a time right now where there's an urgency to what it is that God's doing on the earth. I can feel it. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us. This cannot wait. This cannot wait until there's a more opportune time or a people better equipped or like a better strategy. It cannot wait. This is a now time. There's an urgency to this message. This go is not just a good idea. It's an urgent one. 68 million people are displaced in the world right now. 68, the largest refugee crisis that we've seen in history. I remember being in the Jordan a couple of years ago with a world relief worker, and she was telling me about this incredible thing happening as they're caring for the refugees, for the mostly Syrian Muslim refugees that are in Jordan. She's telling me about the, them coming to faith, to finding Jesus in their dreams at night. They're, they're finding Jesus through the relief efforts of the workers. They're finding, and she just was like, it's incredible. These people are just, we're, we're like accidentally starting churches. Do you know that more Muslims have been saved in the last 10 years than in 1,500 years prior? <laughs> 68 minutes. I remember she was on the, the phone with her mother. She took a phone from her. She's American, uh, young, 20, in her 20s. And uh, just like just incredibly tense time to live in the Jordan right now. And her parents said, you know, we just, we're, we're, we love what you've done, honey. I think you've done a fantastic job. I think God's even proud of you, but it's getting tense. It's getting scary. We need you to come home. It's time to come home. <laughs> this girl, this is what she says to her mother, which is a boldness I have not yet mastered. She says, mom, you prayed every day. I grew up in a home 
And on the, the wall of our kitchen, you had a map of the world. And in the map of the world, you had drawn a line called the 1040 window. And you prayed every day for God to make a way where there was no way. You prayed every day that God would save a people group that could not hear the gospel. You prayed every day of my whole entire life. And she said to her mom, now he's made a way and you don't want me to stay. We must urgently be about the thing to ask God's society. We cannot wait. This is 68 billion people in the world who are longing and waiting, looking for what compassion looks like. This is not just some kind of tragedy, although it is that. It's also a strategy. It's a kingdom strategy. There are possibilities, pockets of darkness. There's an oppression that's happening in the world, and it's horrible. But who cares whose fault it is because I can see the glory of God. Can you? I can see the advance of the kingdom. Can you? This happened all the I was just with a, a group called Heart for Lebanon. They're working in Lebanon. Same thing. I, I can't tell you his name, but there's an incredible uh, previous Muslim, now a Christian believer, a Syrian man who leads the work in the south of Lebanon. And he told me that they had these uh, refugee, uh, they've been helping the refugees uh, for several years now. And he said they have this one lineup for supplies that they always have in these refugee camps. And they have this one lineup for prayer. He told me just a couple of months ago, he said the lineup for prayer is three times longer than the lineup for supplies. And he said, I was saying, what's going on? So I asked them, why are you in this lineup? And the first person said to him, we heard Jesus answers prayers. And the second person said this to him, we heard Jesus is not just for the Christians. We heard Jesus is not just for the Christians. What's amazing about this is Camille, the Lebanese, uh, and Huta, the Lebanese couple that started Heart for Lebanon, they didn't want to. <laughs> What's amazing about this is they fled Lebanon right after the, all of the civil war, and they were personally wounded by Syrians uh, during the, the occupation of Lebanon. And so they, they escaped with their daughters, and they got uh, uh, invited to lead a church in America, a master's degree, and all kinds got resettled in America, the land of plenty. And they were just starting this beautiful ministry, and God woke Camille up and said, I'm calling you to go to Lebanon. Camille said, now's not a good time. <laughs> it's not a good time. We just got out of Lebanon. We just like our friends put all of their money on the line and lent us all these things in favor to get us resettled in America. This church is expecting me to lead it. This is not a good time. And he said he was so disturbed by this that he went on a retreat with his wife to see if it really was God that was speaking or if it was just like he ate the wrong thing for lunch. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And he said, these are the three questions I went into the prayer asking, why me? Why Lebanon? Why now? He said, during the prayer, God gave him John chapter nine. And he explained so gently to Camille and Huda that they were asking all the wrong questions. It's not why me, it's not why now, it's not why Lebanon. It's what is God going to do. It's where is the glory? It's what is the kingdom? It's the advance of God's kingdom in the right now of God's kingdom come. And he spoke to them saying, you must urgently be about the things that I've assigned you to do. So there they went. The Syrian thing had not even happened yet. They were just doing relief work for Iraqis setting up a refugee support system, very natural things, trying to help where they could. After about five, 10 years of setting up this, they thought, wow, look at us, we were obedient to God. This was easier than we thought. And then the Syrian war happened. And 1.2 million Syrians fled and landed in Lebanon. And God said to Camille, if only there was a people who loved Jesus, <laughs> that knew how to do refugee services that could reach them. <laughs> He said, if only there were a people, and Camille realized all of a sudden the people were him. The people were him. And he began to go tent after tent after tent, telling the Muslim Syrian refugees, the people nobody wanted in that country, as a Lebanese person, how can I serve you? How can I love you? What do you need? He said at first the Syrians would say to him, is it a trick? Is it a trick? What do you need? What's the catch? 
He said, there's no catch. Why would you do this? They said to him. He said, because Jesus did this for me. Tent after tent after tent after tent of refugees, understanding, beginning to taste and see that the kingdom is now. This is not about whose fault it is. This is about what God wants to do. I found myself on a visit there in a tent with about 25 Muslim people, a part of a family, all shoved into this tent. And they wanted to see Huda because one of the strategies that they had was to start schools for Syrian children. They're, they've got at least 20 years to kill doing nothing in these makeshift refugee camps. So they said, well, why don't we try educating the kids, at least thinking about a future that's possible for them, for their lives. So they started these schools. And this one Muslim family wanted to talk to us. So they called us in and they said, we want to ask a question about our daughter who goes to your school. So we were all a tiny bit nervous because we're like, ah, it's a Christian school. So we go into this Muslim family, 25 family members all shoved into this tent. And they said, when we sent our daughter to this school, we were, we were, we were convinced you were going to send her back because she'd been traumatized by the war. We thought it's hopeless, but we have nothing to lose. So we sent her anyway. And she said, to our surprise, every day, this little girl would come back to us a little bit more like herself a little calmer, a little more peaceful. And then finally the day came where she was completely even better than her old self. And we asked her, what has happened at that school? What are they teaching you? What are you learning? And this little eight-year-old girl said, they taught me about Jesus. And Jesus has healed me. I'm sitting in this tent with this eight-year-old apostle. And the mother says to Huda, running the whole, uh, the whole organization, she says to her, so we've called you into our tent to ask you this, could we know Jesus too? <laughs> Kingdom is now. Time is now, guys. Time is now. Kingdom is here. Repent and believe the good news. So then this is the question, how does Jesus do this. How does this happen? I'm going to give you four principles really quick that Jesus uses to be about the kingdom of God, to advance the kingdom of God in desperate and oppressive situations. Here's number one. Jesus uses every natural human remedy possible. Jesus uses every natural human remedy possible. And this is very, very helpful to keep in mind. This is what Jesus does literally. He spits on the ground. I did not see that one coming. Right? You need a miracle? Just a second. <laughs> right? You need a move of God? Just a second. I got to spit and make some mud right here. Jesus is using the most basic human elements. If it was today, Jesus would be getting out the duct tape. If you're from America, he'd be using the ranch dressing. Every human natural means possible. You remember when Jesus had to feed 5,000 people and he just was like, how am I gonna do this? And he looked up to heaven and he prayed a glorious prayer and then, you know, little, little fairy dusts came and little sprinkled the people and they all of a sudden were like, wow, I'm not hungry anymore. No, you don't know that. That never happened. That's not how God works. God said, is there anybody here who has anything at all? And somebody had a lunch. Just some food, a little bit of food, some actual food, people. And Jesus took the natural thing and infused it with supernatural power. And see, we convince ourselves all the time, some, sometimes as people of God, that what we need is a miracle. And I'm always like, yeah, we sure do need a miracle, but it's going to look like mud, and it's going to look like spit, and it's going to look like refugee tents, and it's going to look like foster homes, and it's going to look like, you know, food for hungry people. It's going to look like a natural means because that's what God uses to bring about his kingdom. And we know that no matter how much mud and no matter how much spit Jesus might have put on that man's eyes, it would not have healed a man born blind. Because what Jesus does, principle number two, is he infuses every natural means with supernatural power. He infuses every natural means with supernatural power. Now here's principle number three. <laughs> Jesus empowers people. 
Jesus empowers people. Jesus does not see the lost, the least, the lonely. He does not see a blind man from his very birth sitting outside and excluded from community as a person with no choice, as a person just to pity, as a person just to feel sorry for. Jesus sees him completely different. And the first thing Jesus does when he sees him and the opportunity that is there is he gives that man a choice. He gives that man a choice. The definition, by the way, of poverty is disempowerment. It's the inability to choose for yourself. And Jesus does this, you'll see, this is familiar in Jesus' ministry all the time, is he'll say to people, even people, like the blind guy, do you remember the blind guy who just wouldn't shut up, who just was like, "Be Jesus, have mercy, and everyone's like, shh, you're bugging him. And finally, Jesus calls the blind man to himself, and he says, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, are you for real right now? The guy is blind and he's been crying all day long. Like you really don't know what he wants. But the point is not that Jesus can meet the need. The point is that that person has the capacity to choose because that's what the gospel does. It empowers people. That's what the good news is, is that you were created with all the faculties of every other human being, that there's a dignity within you, that there's a choice within you, that there's a capacity inside of you. And the gospel calls it out. The gospel empowers people. We're not just called to pity them. We're not just called even just to serve them. We're called to empower them. I discovered, I was trying to uh, combat human trafficking for 22 years, all sorts of things all over, uh, all kinds of different countries. It's hard work, that stuff. It's desperate. It's scary. I remember in America, in LA, a couple of years ago, I was setting up some strategies and we came across this study. It said that uh, 70 to 80%, depending on the city, 70 to 80% of domestic sex trafficking victims come from the foster care. And we were like, whoa, that is heavy. That is sad. And we just were like hanging out in that spot where we're like, whose fault is that? <laughs> That's easy, that's a temptation. Whose fault is that? It's the city's fault, it's the system's fault, it's the church's fault, it's the community's fault. It's a, we're, just like, we're just like having a good time riffing on whose fault is it. And then God just said, wait, guys, hello, guys, hello. You know the names of 70 to 80% of the victims of trafficking in America. <laughs> Welcome to the party. There's something you can do now. There's people that you can meet now. There's names that you have on a list. You could get there. We suddenly realized, oh my, oh wow, the kingdom is now. We started realizing if traffickers can target vulnerable girls for exploitation, surely the church could target vulnerable girls for redemption. What's kingdom lens on. Put a kingdom lens on, guys. Put a pink. This is not just about the movement of your heart. This is about just strategy. This is about kingdom mindset. This is about a perspective that says the time's now and the kingdom's here. We must urgently be about the things that God has taught us. Principle three, empower people. And here's the final principle. Jesus uses, this is fascinating. I wish I had more time for this because it's so much fun. But Jesus uses just enough mud and just enough spit to break the Sabbath law. <laughs> Jesus uses, uh, this is awesome, isn't it? Isn't this fun? Don't you love it? Jesus uses just enough spit and just enough saliva to break the Sabbath law. Why? So my uh, son, last year, he's eight. He uh, still couldn't ride his bike without his training wheels. He's a safety guy. His name's Judah. He's very cautious. He thinks everything through. He's the opposite of me. <laughs> he sees yellow. He slows down. <laughs> and I was getting, I was out with him. We were trying to ride. He was riding this bike with training wheels, but he's eight years old. And this like little neighbor's kid, a little girl, five years old, just sped by on a bike without training wheels and I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> like I just was like, Judah, like this is it. This is the day. Like this is it. It's not happening. So I said, Judah, I just gave my best. Like, you know, I just was like, just turned it on. I was like, Judah, you are ready. You are strong. Like you can do this. Like you're capable. Like I believe in you. Like give it a try. And he goes, but if I put them up, if you take them off, I'm going to fall. And then like, ah, and I said, yeah, but actually let's not just take them off. Let's just 
let's just pop them up. Just one ride, just try one time. And if you're like not sure with it, then we'll put them back down and everything will go back to normal. And he goes, okay, one time, one time. So I pop those training wheels up. And Judah takes off like the wind, like it turns into a chariots of fire film. And like the heavens open and there's music and slow-mo and Judah comes back with his big smile. He's like, mom, I can totally ride a bike. And I said, I knew it. Like I knew it, way to go, buddy. Like this is awesome. And then he looks at me and he goes, you can totally preach this. <laughs> and I said, thanks, honey. And he said, no, mom, think about it. He looks at me. He said, think about it. My training wheels were holding me back. <laughs> Religious systems and structures that hold you back. Oh, sure, they were created for all the right reasons. Safety. To, to stop you from falling, to to shoulder the blow, you know, to take the risk away. Oh, for sure. They're created for all the right reasons. But systems, no matter how religious they are, no matter how spiritual they sound, if they hold the gospel back from getting where the gospel was always meant to go, Jesus will break them. He'll break them every time. Does it offend your sensibilities to release women to minister? I don't care. Does it offend you that Jesus will send a blind man totally unclean to the pool of Siloam, which by the way means sent, which means Jesus sees him not just as someone to care for, but someone to send, an apostle of apostles. He's the first witness in the gospels, people. The first apostle sent to whom? <laughs> the religious, keep reading. It turns into a Monty Python skit. To the religious, does it offend you that Jesus uses people unworthy, unclean, incapable, unlearned, not educated enough? I don't care. I pray that God would break every religious barrier every single one, even in me, that he would break every religious barrier in me that would hold the gospel from getting where the gospel needs to go, to the, to the excluded, outside the city gates, to those who the world's given up on, all those places that are too hard, all of those people that are too far gone, anywhere there's a gathering and people are discussing whose fault is it, that's where I want to go, that's where I want to go with Jesus. That's where I want to go because the time is now. The kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news. Let me pray with you. God, we, just, we want to get it. We don't want to get lost in the tragedy. We want to get lost in the strategy. We want to get lost in the strategy. I just pray right now that you would, you would give us eyes to see every oppression we can find, every lost cause. Would you show us what you see? Show us what you see. I pray right now, even Spirit of God, give us a sense of urgency. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us. Come, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey family, I trust that that message encouraged and inspired you. Um, and as we are out today, particularly uh, in Deep Slut Serving, I pray that beyond what we do twice a year, that we would feel a call to be people who are following Jesus, making disciples and serving the poor daily, regularly that we're not waiting for a church organized event to do what God has called us to do in our pursuit of following him. And so may you be encouraged towards that end. Um, as we close, I want to mention one last announcement is that this, is that we 
are going to be closing off our pathways class during December and we're going to be reopening again in January. And so if you had already signed up for pathways and you haven't already been connected, uh, look out for an email or a notice for early January as we're going to be coming back resuming by the end of January rather uh, our pathways class. So looking forward uh, for that to continue next year. Now with that being said, I want to bless you in this way. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may he give you shalom, fill you with his spirit, give you wisdom. Amen. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Mm -hmm. All of earth and heaven pour. and stands tall mm -hmm. He stands up and stands tall Earth and heaven fall.